All right, the topic of this lecture is um, the ancient Greek underworld. And um, along with that comes uh, divine figures that are associated with the underworld, notably the god Hades and his, um, his bride Persephone. And we'll be encountering these figures uh, also later on in the course, particularly Persephone, as she figures um, prominently in, uh, kind of some, in some specific Greek uh, religious ideas about what happens uh, to you when you die. But I want to start this presentation by uh, dispelling I, what I take to be some common misconceptions about um, about Hades, both the god and also the place that bears his name. And I think that a lot of these these conceptions come from um, the fact that uh, over time, uh, understandings of kind of the Greek underworld have been merged with maybe we might, what we might call kind of popular. Judeo-Christian notions of hell, and so it's because of that it's 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 assumed that um, that Hades is a is a god who is who is evil. He's a, 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 a satanic type figure because he dwells in the underworld in that dark and, and dingy place. Um, and while I think some of that, of course, is warranted um, in that that uh, the fear of death is something that is. Um, is something that's shared by all of humanity across time. Um, and Hades is the god of that particular um, uh, aspect. But uh, by and large, if we really investigate um, what the Greeks thought about uh, the underworld, and if we look through some of the you know the imagery associated with them, I think we at least get a, a, another facet to it, and uh, maybe a better understanding um, of, uh, or at least a broader understanding of how the Greeks um, considered uh, notions of the afterlife. And so I start with this. This, this is a, uh, a notable free sculpture that shows the two prominent um, deities out there in the underworld. In the background, you can see there is Hades, and then here is Persephone. And like I said, we'll talk more about her, um, but she is, um, again, a young um, female divine uh, deity, daughter of the goddess Demeter. Um, she, she is kidnapped by, by Hades, um, taken down into the underworld, and is more or less forced to be his bride. But over time, through her mythology, she, in some ways, she, she kind of takes over. You'll see, you know, in this free sculpture, um, uh, she's prominent. She's foregrounded. Hades is kind of lurking in the background. In fact, Hades, the name Hades, might in fact even mean something like the invisible one or the unseen one. And, and indeed, there are very few myths, narratives, that feature Hades as a particular actor. Persephone takes over that role fairly quickly. And so we see them here seated on the on their thrones in the underworld, and I just call your attention. There's there's nothing in this frieze that suggests these are di dread, dire, evil, satanic figures, um, you know, uh, you know, torturing the damned uh, in the underworld. No, it, quite the opposite. Uh, they hold stalks of wheat and other um, uh, agriculture. They have bowls of seeds, uh, as such. They are depicted here as we might call kind of agricultural fertility deities. And I think this stems from the fact that um, when uh, you, you know you have to you know to really fully understand this, you have to kind of you have to think like an ancient Greek. You have to kind of see the world in these broadly kind of metaphorical, poetic terms. I think to really kind of get down to just to, to how they saw the world, to step into their shoes. So imagine you you're a Greek farmer looking out at your land and you're watching your crops grow up out of the ground. You might ask the question, you know, well, where is that? power coming from? What's giving life to the crops, which gives life to me? Well, it's coming from below ground. And so there's this idea that um, part of the job of the of the gods and goddesses of the underworld was to feed the living. Um, uh, almost a, uh, there's a Greek proverb that goes along the lines of, of uh, it's the job of the dead to feed the living. And so they represent that power beneath the earth, which gives life uh, uh, above it. And so they play this very fundamental and in, in many ways very positive role for the land of the living. Now you'll notice also uh, Persephone clutches a rooster in her lap here, and there's also a rooster here down beneath her throne. Um, these roosters for the Greeks, uh, the, the rooster is a, um, I mean, it's a bird that is uh, is a symbol of many different things across cultures. Um, but one of the ways the Greeks used it, that um, the the rooster represents kind of the boundary between death and life, light and dark. If you think about, you know, what does the rooster do when the when the sun comes up? It, it crows, you know, the old cock-a-doodle-doo. So they mark that transition point. Uh, we call it this liminal point, this in-between point, um, dark and light, and extend that metaphor, uh, day and night, extend it further, life and death. 
And so uh, the rooster represents that boundary, that very important boundary between the land of the living and the land of the dead. And so, uh, you know, to an ancient viewer, they would have seen this rooster and they would have understood, I think inherently, that uh, not only is it the job of these deities to feed the living in the land above them, but to protect that uh, essential, perhaps the most essential boundary between the land of the living and the land of, of, of the dead. So you can see it's a far cry from any kind of cartoonish satanic notion that might have been um, you know, foisted upon these figures uh, through a kind of a, maybe a later kind of Judeo-Christian interpretations uh, of these things. So this is a more kind of a grounded Greek view of these um, of these figures. So uh, some more art here. Over here we have um, the figure of, of Hades, uh, a statue group here. Again, he's one of the big three brothers, and his two brothers are Poseidon and Zeus. So you remember that, um, you know, when the Olympians take over, they more or less divide up the realms of the universe. Uh, Zeus gets the sky, the most prominent uh, real estate. Uh, Poseidon gets the sea. Uh, he's also an earth shaker, so he's kind of an earth god too. Um, but really, goddesses take over the earth part, and then Hades gets the um, draws the short straw, we might say, and gets the gets the underworld. Um, so he's uh, the way he's depicted is 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 typical of his brothers, kind of permanently middle aged, heavily bearded. Now, another uh, kind of famous uh, detail that many people have heard about in Greek mythology is his dog Cerberus, um, who is most notable, but usually depicted as having three heads. Now, there too, I think think that um, we might have a slight misconception. Um, the fact that Cerberus three head, has three heads makes him, um, well, for lack of a better term, creepy. And, um, and because he's a three-headed dog, it makes him demonic. It makes him dangerous. It makes him dread. And well, I think definitely that there's part of that that's very, very true. Um, I mean, you look over here on this face painting here. This is um, uh, Heracles or Hercules, um, who has... Uh, borrowed the dog uh, to accomplish the last of his labors here. Um, he has to, in, in just as a bit of a foreshadowing, Hercules has to prove his labors to this guy, Eurystheus. And uh, Eurystheus becomes more and more afraid of whatever uh, Herc is going to bring through the door. So he has this giant jar that he can jump into to save himself. So you can see him um, uh, he with his hands up in the air. Oh, no! Um, yeah, if you, again, if you look at Cerberus here, I mean, there's definitely, it's very obvious that the Greeks did think of him as, as a dread figure. I mean, there's no way around that. I mean, this, this artist has even gone so far as not only give him three heads, but he has snakes growing out of parts of his body. It's almost just to amp up the horror. So I, I'm not denying that there's that dread part of him, but I think there's also a practicality to it as well. If we think of that, like I was just saying on the previous slide, if that boundary between light and dark, life and death is so important, you want the best watchdog that you can possibly have. And so I think there's an aspect that, why does Cerberus have three heads? Not just to make him demonic and creepy, but to make him a really good watchdog. Whereas a, a, you know, a regular watchdog would just have two eyes, he's got six eyes. A um, regular watchdog has one head, he's got three heads. And so we can constantly be scanning and protecting that boundary. I think that's a big part of it that's I think is often unappreciated. Another figure that many people have heard of, or kind of a popular idea, is um, you know the way that you get to the underworld is you cross the river. Um, usually, it's the river Styx is the most famous. Of them. There's there's a number of rivers in the Greek underworld. The Greeks were not consistent about these kinds of things. And there too, if you look at kind of later depictions, this is just a cartoon I pulled off the web. Um, the the the, uh, the figure of Charon, uh, the ferryman, who you pay your coin to so you can your soul can travel across uh, that. Um, that boundary into the underworld. He's more often than nine out of ten times, um, or maybe even ten out of ten times in kind of modern depictions. He's kind of a dread, demonic figure, skeletal, glowing eyes. He's he's a uh, he's very hellish in the way that he's depicted. So here, this cartoonist has clearly merged the figure of Karin, the ferryman. Um, he's in his boat. He's got his oar here with the figure of the Grim Reaper. Um, you know, he comes with his scythe to, you know, to reap the harvest of your life um, at, at its very end. But if you look at kind of ancient depictions, this is a funerary vase. Uh, the ancient Greeks would often mark their graves with painted, decorated vases. What we have here is um, the figure of Hermes, who we'll talk about soon. He's given away by the wings on his hat. One of Hermes' jobs was, uh, they called him the psychopomp, which just means the, the soul guide. And um, he, uh, and one of her, the things that Hermes does as a god that many other gods don't is that he travels across these boundaries. And so he's, um, one of his jobs was to guide the, the soul of the dead down to the shores of the river Styx and uh, ensure that that crossing 
was uh, was made. So here we have in this funeral face, we have Hermes. He's grabbing the arm of this woman. This is very likely the 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 woman whose grave this marked, and he's taking her to uh, the boat here. And here's Karin. And you can see that, again, there's no skeletal, demonic, uh, you know, uh, kind of satanic imagery associated with him. He's got kind of a ratty cloak on. The cap that he wears marks him as a slave. Um, he's just a guy with a crappy job. Um, but there's nothing about him that would, you know, speak to a, a, a kind of cartoony... Um, you know, kind of satanic hell, as he's often um, uh, looked at. So all this together, they can, this is not to say that the Greeks didn't fear death. Every culture has feared death. Um, but this is, I think this is just to illustrate how some of our kind of our modern notions and how these stories have been kind of interpreted and changed and, and massaged along the way over the centuries, I think has changed it uh, uh, to uh, in many ways from how the Greeks saw these uh, and understood these figures. Now here's a map of the underworld. Again, I just found this on the web, and I thought it was I thought it was useful. Um, I did not make this as uh, Mr. Carlos Parada, whoever he is. I thank him. Um, and this is also I don't want to suggest that uh, that the, you know you look at this map and the, and, and um, what follows that this is what all Greeks believed. Um, uh, like like I said, I think earlier in this lecture, the Greeks were not consistent about these things. They did did not have a consistent theology across the board. Um, cultures that have um, you know. Uh, a polytheistic system with many gods don't have consistent theologies almost by default. Uh, I mean, uh, cultures that uh, adhere to a monotheistic uh, uh, expression of divinity don't have consistent theologies, and, and the Greeks were no exceptions. And so, um, it's always important to recognize that um, and you know tip our cap to how much we simply don't know. Um, but what we do have are a number of stories, and so we, I think we have kind of a broad suggestion about a number of ideas about uh, what the underworld what was like. And so and Homer gives us, gives us one of these first ones. Um, Odysseus comes, as, he, as we learn in Book 11. Uh, Odysseus doesn't go, enter into the underworld, but he comes to the edge, and he makes that sacrifice, and he slits the throat of the, of the, of the, of the lamb, the ram, and then the ghosts come to him, and they drink the blood, and they're able to con con converse with him, and this is where he meets all of these people from his past, and this is where he meets Tiresias, the blind prophet, who tells him the next step towards getting home and the like. But for Homer, the underworld was kind of this shadowy, unknowable place on which Odysseus just gets a little bit of a glimpse into without getting kind of a, a grand tour of it. You'll see that uh, Mr. Parada here has kind of uh, depicted a number of these rivers um, that are often mentioned in um, in kind of Greek underworld stories. Styx is the most famous of them. Uh, famous of them. Styx in ancient Greek just means hate. Um, and so, I mean, I mean, uh, speaking of um, you know, wars that suggest something hellish, I mean, uh, hate, not a very... Not a very uh, doesn't doesn't um, uh, seem to predict happiness on the other side of it. Other other um, other rivers that show up, uh, Phlegathon, which means something like you know being kind of mournful, Cocytus, the the bubbling, boiling place, Acheron, the sharp, dangerous place flowing together. So this is just kind of an idea that tries to merge a number of these ideas. Now later on, when the Romans get a hold of this um, of this kind of mythology. Um, they expand it, uh, um, and so again, if you know something about kind of the broader uh, uh, kind of aspects of ancient Greek culture, ancient Roman culture, the Romans were the great builders. The Romans were the great organizers, and so it, it might not surprise us then that the the Roman underworld is a, is kind of like a department store. It's much more laid out. It's much more distinct. And there's a famous legend that the Romans told about their own origins, which involved the figure of Aeneas. And Aeneas is he he shows up in Greek legend. He actually shows up in Homer's Iliad. He's a Trojan warrior. And there were legends that Aeneas was one of the very few Trojans who would escape Troy. And there was a prophecy about Aeneas that he would be destined to found a new Troy somewhere in the west. And the Romans seized upon that prophecy that lingered there in the legends and says, well, that new Troy, that must be us. And so they linked their own mythology uh, to the ancient Greek uh, um, narratives, which they were so enamored with. And so, uh, long story short, one of the, the adventures that Aeneas goes on in his own journeys is that um, he's called upon, just like Odysseus is called upon to consult Tiresias, Aeneas has to find the shade, the spirit of his dead father um, in the underworld. And so Aeneas actually gets in the boat with Karin, crosses sticks, and enters into the underworld. And we, we get kind of this Roman tour of, of the underworld, and, and he gets to a point where on the left he sees Tartarus, which is a kind of Romanized hell. In fact, um, 
in the Christian New Testament, which um, some of you may know was written in Greek. That's one of the words that is often used for hell, that's translated as hell. And he hears the cries of the damned and the tortured over here. And then off to the right, beyond the palace of Hades, is Elysium, a kind of a Greek Greco-Roman heaven. Um, where in the uh, in Aeneas' story, this is where kind of the best of the best warriors come to congregate. It's kind of an all-male heroic uh, heaven where they can go competing and exercising um, uh, with each other. Um, uh, and beyond that, um, uh, as you'll read in the Powell text, there were other stories where after a certain amount of time, maybe a thousand years in Elysium, the spirits would drink from the river Lethe, which means forgetfulness, to forget, and they would be reincarnated. Um, back into the upper world, and uh, we tend to kind of associate reincarnation as a, as an Eastern idea from a Western viewpoint, but um, it's right there, in uh, in Plato uh, himself. Um, you can't get much more kind of Western philosophy than uh, than Plato. So I get uh, take all of this with a grain of salt. Um, this is a kind of a combination of a number of ideas, and I don't want you to walk away from from this to thinking, well, this is what every Greek believed. No, we simply don't know. Uh, we have kind of an amalgam, a combination of a number of stories, which gives us a broad idea um, about kind of notions of the afterlife. This will, I think, will come into kind of sharper focus when we when we we talk in just a uh, a week or two about ancient Greek religion, and there we can kind of focus on particular cultic beliefs, which um, we can get more specific about. Now, there's a really interesting uh, kind of I love these places these these um, places where you can connect. Uh, kind of on the ground archaeology with kind of mythic uh, story and narrative and, and, and belief. Um, and this is one of them. And way up here in the northwestern part of, of, uh, of Greece is a place called Ephira. And there, um, there's some notion that even the Greeks themselves uh, associated this area with Odysseus's descent into the underworld, that book 11 of the Odyssey. There, is even, there are even rivers that flow past here, near here, um, that are named, I think there was a river Styx up there, and an Acheron. Uh, we don't know how kind of, we, we, I don't think we really know how far back those, those names go, but that too is suggestive. Uh, names are sticky. Uh, they tend not to change very easily. They tend to be, um, uh, they tend to stick around, which again also seems to support this idea that this was an, an area that maybe the Greeks thought of as kind of the, the edge of things, or at least that here was an, an entrance uh, to, the, to the underworld. We know that applies to another, um, a few other places in, in the Greek landscape. Now, what, there's a really interesting archaeological remain there at Ephira, um, what archaeologists call a necromanteon, which in Greek just means an oracle of the dead. And so we know that at least at some point, this was a place where people could go. Uh, we'll be talking about oracles very soon. We, we, we've talked about oracles with Zeus, and we'll talk about them again with Apollo. Um, but there were also oracles where you could consult uh, the dead, maybe the, um, the spirit of a, of a dead relative or um, a dead wise person or something. And this seems to have been a very important one of them. I'll show you what it looks like in just a moment, but here's kind of a blueprint of, of the building today. There, now, I should say before we get into this, there's a lot of controversy about this site amongst archaeologists. Some kind of fully buy into the necromantic aspect of it, and some say well, there's not enough evidence to decide. Um, so keep that in mind as we go through this. But the suggested um, kind of recreation of the consultation of the oracle might have gone something like this. You would have entered the building on this side, and you would have entered this and what we surmise um, into um, complete darkness. And we know that this was a, kind of a part of kind of meeting the gods or uh, you know, consulting the spirit world. One of the things that often happens in these rituals is you have to disorient yourself. It's almost like you have to lose your place, lose your grounding in the real world, um, in the living world, to get yourself into a state of mind, into a state of being where you, being where you can meet you know, the other. And this building seems to have been designed to do that. And so you enter into darkness, and you turn this corner, and it's this area that's, uh, again, archaeologists have debated about it, but um, th those who argue for that this was a, an oracle of the dead say this is what this is, is a little labyrinth down here, this little maze, um, again, that would have uh, been completely covered in darkness in antiquity. And the idea seems to be you disorient yourself, you kind of lose your bearing, you know, you, you, you don't know which way you're, your way you're facing as you feel your way through this little maze, and then you enter into the main sanctuary, and it's back here at the edge of this room where archaeologists have found what seem to be kind of ritual sacrificial uh, magical artifacts which may have been used in the, the consultation uh, of the dead so it's the, it, from there you can see it's, it's it's not that much of a jump 
to kind of associate this place with um, the spot where uh, Odysseus came and made his sacrifice. And so it was this Necromantean built over this spot because of those associations with, with Odysseus. And the Greeks themselves, historically speaking, carried on this tradition of consulting this dead in this, um, in this strange little sanctuary. So here's what it looks like today from the outside. Um, there are the remains of a, of a church there. I think this church dates back, dates back to maybe the 9th or the 10th century AD. Um, as so often happened is in many of these places where there were kind of uh, ancient pre-Christian, you know, pagan polytheistic sanctuaries, when these lands became Christianized, um, in some cases, yes, the, uh, there were Christians who, who knocked the temples down, uh, burned them, destroyed them. But in other times, um, it's almost as if the, 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 the later wave of Christians said, well, the ancients considered this uh, uh, um, uh, sanctified. They considered it holy. We will too. We will just consecrate it under the banner uh, of our own God. So um, that seems what happened here is that when you find kind of a church built on on top of an ancient remains, it very likely suggests that the um, the church was placed there because it was used as a divine sanctuary uh, in pre-Christian days. So now this is uh, um, having walked through. This is just a picture I took a number of years ago when I was there with a group of students, and we've walked uh, kind of through that main corridor. And this is that labyrinth. Now again, it's there's not much remaining here, um, but you can see the students kind of winding around the path here. And um, but imagine this has been all closed in the darkness as you kind of feel your way through this, disorienting yourselves before you enter back inside the main sanctuary here. Now I took a little video here. I'll, I'll see if this works. Um, uh, I don't think it's going to work here. It's not playing. I think the technology is 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 outdated. I mean, it's not a big deal. It just kind of I, I uh, with my old camera, I kind of walked through the labyrinth. It kind of shows you the path, but um, not a big deal that it that it works here. Um, but you get into that main sanctuary. Um, and so the main sanctuary is up above the floor here. They've now put a kind of a door in the floor here and put this this um, rickety metal staircase that takes you down. And you quickly realize that um, where people are making the, the, the sacrifices, right below it is this massive underground chamber, this vaulted chamber down here. So that main sanctuary is up here. And um, many archaeologists and historians believe that this, this kind of chamber below here was uh, believed by the Greeks to be kind of the gathering place for those ghosts as they kind of came up from hell or Hades and up to the upper sanctuary, drawn by the rituals, drawn by the sacrifice and, and the like. Um, and so here we are down in uh, with a, this group of students I took down in this chamber here. Um, I love this picture because, uh, you know, it, this is kind of, you know, where... Uh, you know, Earth meets Hell, as it were, and I, I didn't add any. I didn't Photoshop it, shop, Photoshop this at all. But um, here, Joe's face is green; his eyes are glowing. Katie over here has kind of a weird green face, and so it's kind of an, an eerie aspect. And so, I mean, when we were down there, it's completely dark, um, except for kind of one side light lamp over here. And so, I, I, I took this with a flash, and this is this was the the result. So, at the end of the day, I guess you know we don't really know. What this chamber was all about. Um, we have a, a lack of evidence uh, in the face of this, but there's some really intriguing um, possibilities of this being used as an oracle of the dead and these really kind of interesting connections to Book 11 of the Odyssey. Now, um, there, uh, for the most part, even if you saw an Odyssey Book 11, um, the vast majority of the dead that are down there. It's just kind of this warehouse of, of souls, right? It's this place of nothingness. It's not reward. It's not punishment. It's just kind of nothing. Um, if you'll remember that, what I think is a really key scene is when Odysseus meets Achilles, and um, Odysseus simply assumes he says he says something to Achilles like, "You are the greatest warrior that ever lived, and you know, nobody was more respected than you, Achilles." And he says something, you know, so don't lament your death at all. Kind of assuming like. Um, almost the idea of that because people loved you and you remembered so well uh clearly that has extended into your afterlife right achilles and achilles he throws cold water all over it and says don't sell me on death um i'd rather be uh, you know the lowliest slave on earth and be king all over uh, than uh, than be king over all of these useless dead and odysseus sees in that moment that um there's really nothing waiting for him on the other side and so while the, so it's see, that what homer suggests again to what degree does this inform how the Greeks believed about these things? We don't really know. Uh, but Homer suggests that the vast majority of people who die just kind of end up in this limbo. Um, but there is, even in Book 11, there's a place, there's a corner for the worst of the worst. And there's these famous uh, sinners in, um, 
in uh, in Greek mythology. Tantalus is one of the most is famous one. It's from his name that we get our word tantalize. And the Greeks were very good at kind of coming up with with creative um, punishments, tortures. Uh, so Tantalus is given this you know this hunger and a thirst, and he's placed in this river. And when every time he tries to dip down to drink from the river, the river recedes, and this branch of um, te- um, you know, tempting fruit is above him. And every time he reaches for it, a wind blows it just out of his reach. So he's endlessly tortured and tantalized. Um, uh, for his uh, his crimes on Earth, Sisyphus is another famous one, where he is um, he has I think there's a, a the stories about him is that he, um, he either cheats death or he attempts to rape Hera. Either way, um, not good, and he's condemned to roll this rock up the hill um, and to um, uh, he can, he's freed from his labors if he can finally get the rock to the top of that hill. But the the um, just like with Tantalus, his tortures are endless. Just as he gets the rock up there, rolls all the way back down, and he's just started over and over and over again. So a lot of these Greek punishments are kind of almost punishments of boredom, tedium, as being kind of the worst thing that you can imagine. Here you can see Sisyphus is flanked by, here's Hades over here, and then there's Persephone. And she, again, she's got those stalks of wheat that uh, under uh, uh, that undergird, that underline her agricultural fertility aspects. Uh, the Donyids is, is another one. Um, these are a group of young women, and usually in most stories it's 50 of them, and um, all 50 of them um, murdered their husbands on their wedding night, and so they were condemned to hell. And their their uh, torture is very Sisyphean. Uh, they are uh, they gather water, um, you know, which was you know um, going down to the well and bring it back to the household, a typical chore perhaps for a, an ancient Greek woman back in the day. Um, but they have to fill this uh, this jar. And they get the same idea that their tortures are over once that they can f- get this um, this jar filled up to the brim. But of course, the catch is is that the uh, the jar always leaks out just enough that they can never full it. And so they too are kind of endlessly tortured um, in this very tedious um, uh, kind of mind numbing kind of uh, kind of way. All right, that's all I got for you for this one. Um, we'll, again, like I said, we're going to continue our look at kind of notions of the afterlife and the afterworld when we get into kind of a more serious discussion of, of um, religious beliefs on part of the ancient Greeks. Uh, but this is a good grounding for later discussions. See you next time.